Um, okay, great. Thanks, uh, everybody. So do I need this mic and this mic? Is that, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I kind of figured people would have like more beers and drinks by now. Um, but, you know, thanks for listening. Um, so I'm from Textile uh, slash Tableland. We are uh, uh, part sponsors of this event. And um, I'm kind of here to talk about some ideas in general and then a little bit of the specific things that we're working on right now. The thing I'm most excited about that we're building um, and uh, a little bit about what that's going to look like. So. I'm kind of, you know, generally calling it the data layer. And I gave a talk earlier this week that was called It's Time for the Data Layer. Um, and I'm trying to encompass a lot of different ideas into uh, basically what I mean by the data layer. But, you know, we were sort of like, I don't know if, if, if anybody watches, um, you know, HBO, but by now, uh, you know, um, uh, Pied Piper kind of promised us that we would have this, like, ubiquitous internet um, that's fast, cheap, computable, highly available. And that's the internet that... We probably don't deserve, but we were promised it. We probably have the internet that we deserve right now, um, and hopefully we can make it a bit better. But that's what we're kind of going for, right? Like, that's the, that's, the, that's the internet that we want. And the closest thing I can think of to that sort of ubiquitous out there internet is, uh, you know, what we kind of call the cloud today. And there, here's a bit of, there's a little bit of jargon and buzzwords on, on these slides, but, you know, the cloud is this sort of, like, idea that there's a bunch of computers out there with some compute power that we can leverage and wouldn't it be nice if we can sort of like offload a bunch of work to these computers out there. And they're going to give us unlimited scalability and 99.999 unreasonable amounts of uptime and durability and all these good things. And we've kind of come to expect that cloud to be there. And we want to build the next version of that or the better version of that or the safer, or the more secure version of that. Um, but just to give you, you know, to quickly touch on how we got to where we are in the first place. You know, back in the early days of the internet, if I wanted to deploy a website or some, you know, have some sort of application or experience for users or for my you know, um, businesses that I was selling to, I pretty much had to set up a bespoke system where I actually you know, had hard to scale on-prem um, hardware. I'd have an actual database with a database admin that had to manage it for me, expose that through you know, um, uh, APIs and uh, uh, websites and, and all that stuff was a lot of work. And then, you know, there was a lot of development up to in and around 2006 when Amazon um, said, hey, we had to do this all the time. Maybe other people would like to leverage all the infrastructure that we had to build to make our bookstore work. Um, and so we got things like AWS and S3 and, and Amazon really pushed that sort of cloud as a service thing. And, and everybody was like, hey, this is a great idea. So Google comes along, we'll build one of those. You know, Microsoft comes along, we'll also build one of those. And what we got is kind of what we wanted, right? We got this like competitive and innovative cloud service industry, which is exactly what we want to get now when we're talking about, you know, Filecoin service providers. And why, why do we want to create a, a, a crypto economic incentivized network? Because it drives, it drives a market. And what are markets pretty good at? They're pretty good at being efficient. And ideally, we'll get some, somewhere where, you know, like in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you have teams that are just hyper-focused on super-optimizing uh, their rigs and their setup so that they can get an edge on the network. And that's what the market drives. And we, ha we got that with cloud storage. You know, we, it's pretty cheap. It's, it's pretty great, actually. Um, but, and it's good for a bunch of stuff. Um, and I'm going to touch on a couple of things that it's pretty good at. Because some things it promises it's really good at, and, and other things it, it's sort of proven to be pretty good at it in the first place, and, and other things it's sort of not so good at, and we'll talk about those too. Um, but one of the things that I care a lot about is um, I come from a sort of like academic analytics background, and um, it, it turns out that clouds and cloud storage are pretty good at doing things like storing and analyzing and making ac accessible lots of data for analysis. And the way that that kind of works right now is data lakes. Data lakes are this really nice metaphor, and they fit nicely with clouds, because we've got this cloud out there that's just like storing all this liquid data that we can analyze and, and access and blah, blah, blah. And all these metaphors are lovely. And they are, they're going to apply pretty nicely in the web that we're building moving forward as well. Um, but what the clouds get us, they're good for scalability. 
right? I pay and use the things that I need when I need them, and I don't pay for the things that I don't need when I don't need them, because probably someone else is using it when I'm not, and they're paying for it, right? So we're all kind of like, as a network, subsidizing each other. Um, it's super flexible. It offers a bunch of points of integration. And one of the really cool things, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, that the cloud offers is, you know, these different cloud providers have kind of settled on common interfaces and in APIs because they want to be able to snag their competition's customers fairly easily. They're like, oh, you're, you're using S3, we'll undercut that price a little bit if you come move over to our cloud. And it's pretty easy to do that, easy to do that. And they try to make it as hard as possible to do that, but in theory, it's pretty easy. And so you get a pretty cost-effective, like, competitive market like, um, uh, market scape that, um, that you can interact with, and you, in theory, are only paying for the things that you use. And the other thing that markets are really cool for is driving innovation in a lot of cases. And so what we found was, okay, we've got this marketplace of cloud storage providers, and we've got this idea of like object storage that they've all kind of adopted. And then the next thing that happened was a bunch of people were like, wait, I can hyper-optimize my business to take advantage of the service that seems to be becoming ubiquitous. And so we start to get like cloud native. Everything is now cloud native, right? We're designing data structures specifically to leverage the access patterns that those cloud native platforms provide to us. And one thing they're really good at is going and fetching blobs of data in specific ranges of that blobs of data and returning them back to me. And they do that fairly efficiently in terms of like actual speed of retrieval, but also in terms of cost. So it's, it's a lot cheaper for me to stick a giant flat file on a blob storage system somewhere and then ask, have my users, as they're interacting with my website, ask for little bits and pieces of that. And so we've, we've got a whole industry of new data formats and new to data practices that are leveraging exactly how those services have been developed. And in the uh, like data analytics platform, or the data analytics world, that's led to th this concept of a data lake. And in its most basic you know, sense, what that ends up being is like just a bunch of flat binary files and my database running on my system somewhere just going out and fetching little snippets of those flat files. And like, if I told you that's what you know, a, a, a modern analytics platform would have looked like in that pre-cloud era, they would have laughed at me and said that's a terrible waste of like networking resources and power, and actually we've got to put, you know, store it all together so that we have uh, more control, but that's not where we landed. We landed on like optimizing for the actual services that have been provided. So designing for efficient retrieval from cloud object storage services. And these different data sources are driving like all sorts of different industries. So like the geospatial industry that I come from, um, a lot of the new data formats are designed around these like range request style access patterns. So when you interact with like slippy maps of huge, um, you know, huge data sets, like for instance, the um, building footprints that you kind of expect to see when you look at the 3D version on your mobile app, you can, those are stored on systems as giant files that you can page into for different scales of that data. So you've got like literally different scales of data in terms of like geographic scales that you're zooming in and out of, and that's just different range requests into a giant blob stored in some cloud storage service. And, and similarly, we, we actually have entire databases that are stored and accessed this way, where I'm doing analytics on my local machine or on in a, an IPython notebook or something like that, but I never actually have access to the, or have uh, control over the aggregate data. I'm only ever returning little snippets of data that I need to answer my particular queries. And the reason that all of these different data platforms and services and things are building up around this sort of common interface is because the cloud platforms provided a fairly unified interface for data publication and access. Right? It's this very simple thing. It's basically one giant global key value store or maybe some sort of like sharded key value store. Right? I have a bucket. I've got some keys, I put some stuff in there, I stick it in there, whatever it is, I mutate it, I change it, I can retrieve it. The cost structure is fairly well established. I know how much it costs to put data in, I know how much it costs to get data out. Sometimes I get surprised when for some strange reason my like, you know, cat photo upload live, uh, website becomes really popular overnight and I get this crazy bill. Um, 
And that's a bit of a scary thing that Web3 can help uh, in a lot of cases with. But the idea is, you know, it's a very simple and intuitive access pattern. So I guess my take home point is like the cloud is like kind of good actually. And there are a lot of really nice things about it. Um, but it's bad for other stuff. It's not great for certain things. And I'm in a after party um, after the uh, ETH Denver event at a Filecoin event. So I probably don't need to have a slide that says like centralization equals dangerous and decentralized good. Um, but for some reason, we all still do include those slides, just in case anyone forgot, I guess. Um, but there are important reasons why we need to decentralize these things. Some of them are like, you know, we've heard this over and over again, like what about censorship? Security threats are a real thing, right? Like centralized points of, uh, 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 potentially centralized points of failure are like also very attractive things to attack, right? So there are a lot of good reasons to distribute that we've already heard about. But then there's even, there's new ones cropping up every day. And some of those are related to um, uh, things like compliance. Um, some of those things are related to, um, uh, you know, new laws and regulations coming out. So they're, like we're getting more and more new reasons to do this. And I'm hoping that we're also seeing new reasons being because it's cheaper, because it's faster, because it's easier for developers. And a lot of those cases, that's becoming true. Um, it's easier for developers to reason about individual small bits of data that are part of a much larger network of um, data providers. That is true. So there are lots of other good reasons besides just uh, centralization bad. But what we're seeing is that having a path it's not always easy to decentralize your data right away. If you're, you know, we've been talking to a lot of D-pins this week, and sometimes, you know, they just want to build the thing, and it turns out that Amazon S3 or Google Cloud services are pretty easy to use, so they start there. But having a path to decentralizing their full stack is pretty much a critical requirement at this stage. Yet you have to at least understand how you're going to get there for all of the reasons that centralization equal bad, uh, decentralization equal good. And so, you know, oh, I'll just leave you with that, and I could just leave, and then you say, you better figure it out, um, because it's coming. Or I could, you know, try and pitch you my thing, our thing. Um, so my team at Textile is building a product um, that we're calling pro code name Project Basin, because we don't have a good name for it yet. Um, but we're building simple, verifiable data availability protocol uh, with lifecycle management. You can think of it kind of like uh, a decentralized S3. And I'm not going to go into all of the details of how this works. Um, I do have a bunch of like more nerdy slides at the end, so if there's time, I can go into those. Um, this is the sort of like sales pitchy slide, right? It's decentralized object storage. There are a bunch of reasons why it's useful. Um, we're taking the, the, the perspective that there are already developers that are building on S3, so let's go and meet them where they are, provide, with them, provide for them familiar APIs and interfaces, but with all the crypto rails that come with building on top of Filecoin's IPC subnet infrastructure. Right, so we've got all the nice scalability, we've got verifiable, cryptographically verifiable data structures, and that alone is a giant feature that uh, Web3 service providers can't offer. Imagine, if you will, you're sitting at, you know, like we all do, we're sitting at home with our laptops doing database queries, and uh, you make your database query and instead of getting back some bytes and going, oh, geez, I hope that was the right result, you get a cryptographic proof back that the result is correct based on the data that you're expecting to get back from the remote service. Like, if that were a service that you got, you wouldn't not do that, right? Because there's very little additional cost. It's built into the protocol and the network. So that's what Tableland and Textile are building right now, is a fully verifiable uh, remote object storage, decentralized object storage. Um, I'm looking forward to making big announcements about the, the new steps that we're uh, taking to get this um, out to market. But for now, it's a uh, sort of pre-launch. We've got a DevNet um, that we deployed literally in the last couple of days. Um, we're building up use cases with partners. So if you're like, you know what, I think I could use S3, and the answer is you could. I mean, we know that that's true. Come and see us. We would love to do a sort of like POC go-to-market plan with you. Um, we are already doing tons of experiments. Um, here's one that the Filecoin uh, Foundation already uh, tweeted about. One of our favorite partners to work with right now, WeatherXM, 
they got a bunch of awesome deep end data that we have been exploring different um, workflows with. This basin plus, plus, plus Python plus Polar's experiment over weather XM data, this is an actual real uh, data analytics pipeline that we have been able to enable over um, the system that we're building. So we're pretty excited about that. There's so many other use cases and examples that we could explore. Um, and we could explore those together. The map one is something that's pretty near and dear to my heart. And I know a lot of people in the, in the room and industry are also very interested in, in maintaining like global data sets relevant to humanity. Um, so serving custom data, distributing critical data infrastructure. Um, and I would argue that you know, Farcaster uh, timelines are probably you know, becoming pretty important and useful and interesting information. So we did an experiment. Um, syncing Farcaster to uh, Basin, uh, and compute over data as well. Um, because what's the point in storing all this if we can't do something with it? Um, so projects like Backlow and, uh, and uh, Fluence, we'd like to be able to support their interactions with uh, this type of data, verifiable data as well. So come and, and, and explore uh, sort of a new version of cloud native with us. Um, if you've got any data sources or data structures that you'd like to see, hey, can we hyper optimize this to not only provide sort of cloud native um, interactions, but to then do it in a verifiable way, uh, we would love to explore. So thanks very much. Um, thanks for coming out. This is a new thing that Textile is building. So textile.io slash object storage, check it out. I'm pretty sure this QR code will take you there. And if I do have any time, if that's my time, my, my countdown, then I'm almost perfect. Um, but if I also have like, you know, nerdy curl API calls to show you this thing actually does work and returns, uh, you know, transaction data um, and all sorts of fun things like that. This one, here's, here's, here's a cool one. Uh, here's a cool one where you actually can commit to a series of events and get back a Merkle Mountain range uh, root commitment that you can then reference on a EVM chain or something like that. Anyway, Juan. Uh, can you post any IPv6 content type? Like, like, can you post any IPLD content type yeah, into I mean, the. Like yeah, uh, yes. Yes, you can because it, at the end of the day, it's just going to be uh, IPLD encoded data and you can ask the network and you can, or ask the nodes and you can get back. Yeah. Yeah, you should be able to do any arbitrary IPLD structure. Of course, it's IPLD all the way down. Um, so you should be able to do any encoding or whatever. Yeah. Yes? Is this backing up to PowerPoint or just like uh, Great question. So what we want you to be able to do is configure your bucket or whatever we're going to call it, your basin, um, to have different choices for how that works. Um, in some cases, depends. Uh, kind of want hot data, and then they just don't care about it anymore. So they don't even want that on Filecoin anymore. Um, so you, they might not. In other cases, you want it, you know, it's important, you know, environmental data, you want that stuck in a deal on Filecoin. Well, you've got this like bucket, which is an accumulator, which will accumulate that data, and then when you're done with it, you should be able to issue a storage deal on top of that. Um, also, the POC that we built out so far is sidecarding IPFS. So you should also be able to um, make those like make data queries over the IPFS protocol as well. And we're trying to optimize that a little bit because I don't really like the idea of running like full blown Kubo with a full blown like. But there are ways to leverage shared infrastructure to make that a lot nicer. Juan can go, unless someone else wants to go first. Okay, you can go. Um, you could define the, this get post API. Um, since you're moving around IPLD like, stuff, like, this is IPFS like, already. So we just like, use that. I don't think you need to sidecar Google. No, that's true. And in fact, um, you should be able to send like basically, um, uh, what do we call it, uh, detached payload. So you can say, like, I would like to add this file to this bucket but that file is maybe not actually the full bytes of the file, but a reference to that file. Um, and we do have a mechanism within the um, subnet so that if you submit a transaction and say, I would like to you know, add this, these bytes, and those bytes aren't included, then the peers will actually gossip 
uh, among one another and uh, basically come to consensus on when they all have the backing data. So then you can say, oh, cool, now we can submit that transaction completely because we actually have all of the data. Um, so that's kind of super rad. I, I could go into details there, but um, yeah. I'm way over time, so here we go. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah. Thank you so much.